So we know that nitrates are good analgesics for MIs. Depending on the formulation, they vasovenodilate, they decrease platelet aggregation, and they increase lysotropy. However, generally speaking, uh, we would hold them during RVMI specifically because, throwback to uni days, these patients are potentially right preload dependent to maintain their cardiac output. Vasodilators might decrease their right preload um, and potentially exacerbate any hypertension. Now, nitrates are good analgesics. So we have two medium-sized studies that both found a 2.6 out of 10-point pain reduction, 10% of patients having complete pain resolution. And they do this without the risk of P2Y12 inhibitor absorption slowing that opioids may cause. So there's been a few papers in the last few years that have called this into question. So to try and clear it up, our team did a systematic review and a meta-analysis. Here's our research question. As you can see, it's really all just about finding a rate, a relative rate, and comparing that across cardiac regions. Now, we followed the usual uh, five broad stages of a systematic view. There's one thing I want to draw attention to here, which is we included all analytical study designs. We excluded descriptive observational study designs, your case reports and your case series. And that's because our research question is to find a rate and compare that rate across cardiac regions. And case reports and case series are not really good for rates. Um, they are very good in pharmacovigilance for picking up any evidence of a really extreme but rare outcome if you, you know, a patient's head exploded or something like that, which might not be easily captured in larger cohort studies and which might justify a contraindication despite there being no evidence found. So I will come back to this uh, later on in the presentation. Now, the studies we found looked at all of these adverse events. The really important one that everyone cares about is, of course, hypertension. So what did we find? Uh, our systematic review search found all of these studies. Once you exclude your case reports and your case series, you're left with these seven. Step two is to evaluate them for quality, uh, which we did using JBI tools and methods. We excluded two studies for being of low quality. In both, no information was provided on the number of RVMI patients, on the outcomes that were measured, or on how and when these outcomes were measured. So that's pretty extreme stuff. So what are we left with? These five studies. What do they show? Well, in summary, nitrates say, uh, green says that nitrates are equal rates of adverse events across cardiac regions. Red says that there's a difference. We have one study that looked at nitrate peroxide infusion. One looked at nitroglycerin by an unknown dosage and multiple routes of administration. That's the one current contraindications are based off, incidentally. One that looked at nitric oxide, um, which was inhaled, which is going to be a really interesting area of study in the future, I think. And two that looked at your standard sublingual GTN. So first we calculated the rate of, uh, rate of adverse events, the relative risk, absolute risk, and then 95% confidence intervals. Now, if you look at that rate of adverse events column there, you'll see the rate of adverse events vary wildly across the studies. Based on my reading of the studies, my interpretation is that this is most likely due to differences in the inclusion criteria. So obviously you would expect something like inhaled nitric oxide, which has zero adverse events, to have very low adverse events because the effect is limited to the pulmonary circuit. It's not going to cause systemic vasodilation, whereas your sublingual GTN is where we more traditionally think of that. But even the sublingual GTN studies, some of them adopted what they called a clinically relevant definition of hypotension, which was just their way of saying under 90 millimetres of mercury. Some of them adopted your more traditional under 100 millimetres of mercury, a drop of one-third, a drop of 30 millimetres of mercury, and those are the ones with the higher rates of adverse events. So what this really suggests to us, just based on this alone, is that there's probably a majority of patients having very mild adverse events. Now, we did do meta-analysis for the two sublingual GTNs. I'm really not going to spend much time on this because it's only two studies, and both of them had no finding of significance. As you can see, they both cross the null effect line. Obviously, the meta-analyzed meta result does as well. There is one thing I'll point out here, which is uh, McConnell et al., that second study, makes up nearly 60% of our weighting, despite being less than 5% of the pooled sample size. And that's because we use the um, random effects model in order to be risk averse and protect our patients. The key thing here is if we use the fixed effects model, we use, we'll see even less variation from the null effect line. All right. Now, obviously, the interpretation of that is for your standard sublingual GTN, there's no evidence in the current literature of a difference across cardiac regions, and the limitations are as long as your arm, because it's only two studies, it's not good evidence, et cetera, et cetera. We also did the step of sensitivity analysis, of course. We did it all properly. So fixed effects model, as I just said, no variation there. And we also pulled Ferguson et al. Now, this is the study that did find a difference in the rate of adverse events across cardiac regions. From a purely methods point of view, we really shouldn't pull that because it's an unknown dosage, it's multiple routes of administration, 
common sense tells us you would expect to find different rates of adverse events from like a, a transdermal patch, a patch of GTN compared to intravenous or sublingual GTN. But on the flip side, it's also the basis for current international practice. It's a really important study. So we want to know just how much it actually objectively affects our results. This was such a big issue for our team, we actually referred it externally twice to both a statistician and a methodologist. And in the end, we all agreed that sensitivity analysis was probably the place for it. Of course, it doesn't actually change your results. Now, there's a couple of reasons, even though we did find no evidence of a difference across uh, different cardiac regions, why nitrates are even safer than this, like why this is even more the case. First of all, both of our pooled studies compared isolated inferior MI to combined RVMI and inferior MI. Now, common sense tells us that as your penumbra increases, your myocardial performance is going to be increasingly compromised and you're going to have more adverse events. And that's going to be regardless of the cardiac region that's involved, whether this is RVMI or a different one. There's a little bit of evidence to back up this theory, which is in Robichaud et al, isolated inferior MI was the safest at 6.1% rate of adverse events. So what this really means is by using the safest cardiac region as your comparator group, you're actually skewing your results towards making RVMI look unsafe, if that makes sense. There's a second reason too, which I mentioned before, which is um, we use the fixed effects model, uh, sorry, random effects model in order to be safe um, and protect our patients. This means that McConnell et al, despite making up less than 5% of the sample size and only ever having been published as an abstract, made up 60% of our weighting. Still doesn't actually affect our results, but just something to keep in mind. All right, now earlier on I excluded a lot of descriptive observational studies. So what happens if you look at them? Is there evidence that our decisions on inclusion and exclusion suggest some kind of bias which changes our results? The answer is no. So in terms of sheer numbers, there were 10 patients who experienced adverse events and 22 who did not. Of course, in seven of the studies which actually did report adverse events went out of their way to mention that these were transient and easily corrected and did not affect the patient's outcomes. But of course, the really important thing here, as I mentioned before, is any evidence of a really extreme but rare outcome, which might justify a contraindication. In all of the literature, there is not a single report of a patient who died or went into cardiac arrest. So based on all of that, the conclusion of our systematic review was that there is not a current basis with the current evidence for a contraindication on nitrates during RVMI. Look, as you've all seen from the evidence that I've just shown you, our certainty of evidence is extremely low here. There's a handful of studies. They're not good studies. Most of them are kind of semi-incidental. You know, it's not high quality evidence. But there's also no evidence that you should be withholding GTN. All right. Now, if you think we're done, we're not even close. There's another study I want to throw into the mix, which is a 2019 study which stratified patients based on post-angiography on the um, coronary artery that had an occlusion myocardial infarction where the lesion was, and then compared that to any evidence of adverse events post nitrate administration. Now this study found uh, no difference in the rate of um, adverse events from nitrates depending on the area of the lesion with a relative risk of 0 0.99. That's really remarkable because that's as close to there being absolutely no difference at all as you can possibly imagine. I would have expected more difference just through sheer sampling error also found a mean of nine millimetres decrease in blood pressure, regardless of lesion location. Now, this is really not super relevant to what I'm actually talking about, because you can't assume that patients who had a right coronary artery occlusion have RVMI. We, we can't actually calculate that. We don't know how many of them did. The reason I mention it is purely because it's kind of in the same ballpark. It's, it's reassuring, I guess. It's in interesting incidental evidence. Um, but I mean, I'm certainly giving GTN prior to angiography. So this doesn't help me personally very much. All right, so if you're still GCS456 at this point, you're doing really well. Um, now, the current AHA guidelines say to withhold nitrates during RVMI, so do the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. And a lot of you are probably thinking, well, wait a minute, I can't know the evidence base of every single thing that I do. I follow the guidelines because, you know, that's the only way I can manage all this information, which is completely fine. So let's have a closer look at the AHA guidelines. Now, they were last updated in 2015. That's immediately a bit of a worry because the authors of the AHA guidelines haven't been able to consider Robichaud and McConnell, the best bits of evidence we have. If you look at the 2015 guidelines, it actually wasn't updated then. It was last updated back in 2010. So let's look at the 2010 guidelines and see what they reference. There are four references. The first doesn't mention nitrates at all. 
The second recommends giving nitrates. The third is a study that we read and excluded because RVMI was an exclusion criteria and the authors accidentally let five RVMI patients in. They decided to report the results anyway because, you know, what the hell, the patients are already there. But that is incredibly methodologically flawed and certainly not a representative population. The fourth is secondary evidence. It's not a primary research piece. And it doesn't mention nitrates at all, but does include a broad overall statement that RVMI is preload dependent. So it's a bit of a stretch, but you could argue uh, nitrates are preload dependent. Uh, sorry, RVMI is preload dependent. Nitrates reduce preload. Therefore, we should have a contraindication. So what is that study based off? Two studies that don't discuss nitrates at all. One, which we found included, which says that nitrates are safe, and a fourth study that doesn't discuss nitrates but does say that uh, vasodilators are good for all RVMI patients. So I would say there's not a good basis for the current contraindication in the AHA guidelines. Now, we did the same thing with the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. I won't bore you by going through it all again. The references are different. The end results are the same. So what should you do? So obviously, you're only using GTN on your stable patients. You're not using it on people who are borderline hypertensive or decompensating. Remember, we're not saying that nitrates are safe. They're definitely not always safe. We're saying there's no evidence of a difference depending on the cardiac region that's infarcted. Okay? You're going to have them cannulated first. I don't know if you've tried to cannulate after giving GTN. It's incredibly difficult. And you're going to have your patient supine. Give them the GTN. If they're one of the people who become hypertensive, lift up their legs, give them a very gentle fluid challenge that doesn't exacerbate their cardiac workload. Um, and honestly, nitrates have a serum half-life of one to four minutes. If you did absolutely nothing, which I don't recommend, um, your patient would probably be OK. Uh, and of course, as I already mentioned, seven of the studies that did report adverse events went out of their way to point out that there was no actual uh, negative outcomes for, for the patient with this. All right, that's it from me.